Hey everyone, my name is David Rao, and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, um, and a variety of other places when you search for my name, David Rao, or Make Moments Matter. Um, I'm excited tonight to be talking a little bit about, um, about how you can use um, visuals to help your students sort of under understand, um, decode, um, songs, understand melodies, understand form of songs, what I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Talk about like different ways that you can do that um, and maybe some of the mechanics behind that uh, in PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever it is you use, but that'll be in just a minute. So um, as we're going, if you hear me talk about a resource, a book, something you're really interested in, um, you can of course leave a comment. I'll try and um, respond back to that, but there's also a page on my blog where I talk about, where I list all the stuff that I talk about um, so if you hear me talk about the links page, that's what I'm talking about. It's on makemomentsmatter.org. Just click the video tab or wherever you're watching, listening to this video, there should be a direct link somewhere uh, at the bottom of the caption for this video or podcast. Um, so that that's there. If you also want to keep talking after this video is over, there's a Facebook group called Every Moment Matters Music Education Community. Um, just search that in Facebook. You should be able to find us. Otherwise, there is a direct link on the links page as well if you're interested. Okay, a two quick housekeeping things before I jump into lesson ideas. So um, this weekend, this Friday and Saturday, I'm going to be in St. George, Utah at the Utah Music Educators Association State Conference. I'm really excited to be back in Utah. Um, I've never been to St. George, and I know very few people in Utah. So if you're going to be at that conference, please come up and say hi. Um, I'd love to make friends, get recommendations about restaurants. Um, so if you're there come say hi because <laughs> um, I'd love to meet folks and um, and just connect more. So I'm going to be out there this Friday, Saturday. I'm really excited about that. Um, one other reminder is that uh, in the last couple weeks, I have been reissuing old podcasts. Um, there's a series that I recorded in 2018 um, with folks from all around the country about Orf Schulwerk asking, you know, what is Orf? Um, what are the applications and implications and what, what are the... Um, all the details and things about ORF, what makes ORF ORF, why should I be interested in ORF Schulwerk. Um, so if you're interested in that, in those conversations, check it out in the podcast feed. There are currently three episodes. There's going to be another one that comes out this Wednesday. Um, you can scroll way, 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 way back if you're really interested and find them, but they're, they're going to keep coming out. So um, the last couple weeks I've been talking with folks about the first two lessons were sort of like, what is Orf Schulberg, exploring Orf Schulberg just in general. Last week I talked with Beth Maline, well, talked with, I, I reissued the uh, episode with Beth Maline Nelson where we talked about movement and sort of how that plays into Orf Schulberg and, and some practical applications for your classroom. Um, in this week's episode, it's going to be about Recorder. So um, if you want to learn more about Recorder, talk about Recorder, check that out. It's coming out this week um, in your podcast feed. And you can find that Make Moments Matter uh, when you search that in wherever you get podcasts. It's in all the places. Okay, so um, let's talk about visuals. So the reason that I'm, I'm excited to talk about, interested in talking about this, um, is because right now I have a student teacher and um, so in the process of giving over classes to her and giving her more to do, um, we talked about um, you know, what each class is doing and sort of helping her develop, like, what should I teach? How should I teach? Um, a, a lot of it to begin with was she saw me model lessons and then she sort of did, uh, tried to recreate, did a version of that, things like that. And that, uh, for a while, that's just how she got her feet wet, was taking my lessons and doing them, um, just, just sort of recreating them. But as we go, I want her to have more experience taking lessons, processing through them, trying them out on her own, and, um, so one of the things we did was we sat down with the curriculum, we sat down with our pacing guide, and we said like, okay, this is what the kids are gonna do, this is what they have done, um, where's a lesson that sort of fits in that continuum, what are things that, like last year when I didn't have a student teacher, what was I teaching at this time, to sort of process through, and, and I think that's just sort of a cool experience to be able to sit down with someone who has been teaching for a while, um, and say like, okay, well, if I'm gonna take over here, what should I do? What could I do? What? Why would I do that? Um, so we had some really good conversations about that. So in talking about fourth grade, um, fourth grade is getting ready to start recorder. I haven't taught recorder in several years because pandemic and I switched jobs and uh, just uh, there are things that have happened. 
So it was my first year back teaching recorder in a while, and I'm really excited about it. But one of the things we talked about was, you know, okay, what do students need to know before they have a recorder in their hand? What are some valuable things that we would do? Um, what are so what activities can we do now that we can branch off of later? Um, and what are the skills that we want students to learn? So um, in talking about that, we decided on um, a song that she could teach. It's one that um, the students learned last year in third grade. We're bringing it back in fourth grade and adding more this year. Um, it's, a, it's actually the song tidy -O, and there are about a bajillion versions of it. Um, the version with the arrangement we used for the class comes from this book called As American as Apple Pie. This is by Jeff Kriske and Randy DeLellis. These are the folks who wrote the game plan curriculum. Uh, the game plan book series. So if you know game plan, um, these are the folks who are behind it. Um, and so there are a lot of really great arrangements in here. This is one of the books that I think I use most often. Of, of all the resources I have, I use this one so much. Um, but uh, they have a version of Tidio in here. Um, and I think, honestly, let me look at it really quick because I think the version that I sing is not exactly the same. No, it's not exactly the same. But there are so many different versions. So do the one that is most normal and natural for you. Um, so if you know this song, even if you don't, it sort of goes like this. Pass one window, tidy-o. Pass two windows, tidy-o. Pass three windows, tidy-o. Jingle at the window, tidy-o. Jinglin', 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 Joe. Jingle at the window, tidy-o. I do a slightly different version of that. Um, so at the end of, there are basically three phrases. At the end of the first phrase, um, the way I learned it, or the way that I've always done it, is pass one window, tidy-o, pass two windows, tidy-o. Not, not me, Ray, do, but me, Ray, Ray. That's the version I just learned, so sorry if that messes with your brain as I talk about it in this lesson, uh, in this uh, video, but that's the version I learned. Um, there is a version that goes, uh, jingle at the window, tidy-o, 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 jingle at the window, tidy-o. There are, are many versions, do the one that is most natural to you. But in this book, jinglin', 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 joe, jingle at the window, tidy-o, that's the third sort of phrase. Anyway, in this arrangement, what they have you do is there's, they have a little game that you can do, um, a little movement thing. They also have an arrangement here where you have a color part, which is sort of... Um, little sprinkling on top of extra. There's a drone, a, a bordoon that goes underneath. Um, there, there are other little non-pitched parts. There are lots of little things that happen in this arrangement. It's a great book. You should get it. Check it out as American's Apple Pie. But we use that as a basis for what we we're going to do in the class. So when we were talking about recorder, one of the things I said to Kelly was, my student teacher, um, one of the things I said was, I don't teach the recorder as if it's a pre-band instrument. Um, Sorry, the book is As American as Apple Pie by Jeff Kriske and Randy DeLellis. These are the folks who wrote um, Game Plan. So what I what I tell what I told Kelly was like, I don't teach recorder as if it's a pre-band instrument. In fact, nothing I do in my class do I do as a pre-band activity. Um, there are several reasons for that. I am not anti-band. I am very pro-band. My partner is a high school band teacher. So like I am, I was in band. I like band, but I also believe that what I do for elementary school students um, is preparing them for music for a lifetime, not just for secondary music. It's just like if, if we just thought like, oh, I'm only preparing students to be in all state. Well, I would love if kids would be in all state, but that, if that's all I do, I am missing a huge percentage of students. And so I don't think about um, elementary music as a pre-band, pre-choir, pre-anything. It is what it is, and it is its own experience. And so embedded in that experience is improvisation and community building and teaching your ear to listen for certain things and um, confidence in singing and playing and in in engaging in the music making. So when I teach recorder, it really is an, uh, an offshoot of what we're already doing. It's an instrument we can impro improvise on. It's an instrument we can play around and play melodies on. It's the one of the first like really truly melodic things that we use. Um, and it is an ensemble instrument and a solo instrument. So there, there are a lot of great things about it. But when I'm when I was talking with Kelly about um, Recorder in this week, we were saying, you know, really, uh, because we're not really thinking pre-band, when I first start Recorder, I do not teach them um, to play and read on a treble clef staff um, in the first few experiences. Um, because 
all of the, the mental processes that go into playing recorder. There are so many different things. Um, they have to be able to handle uh, breath control. They have to um, handle articulation. They have two hands moving separately. Um, they have, um, you know, just a, a different position, not being able to see. They have to play together and in time. Um, their, their fingers have to move independent, like all of these things. And then if, if they're reading notation, that involves an entirely different part of the brain and icons versus finger positions versus self. I mean, there's so much. So when my students first start playing recorder, we start with just rhythms with either the note names underneath or just solfege, um, or they just copy and echo. There's, there's a lot of that going on to begin with. So when including this in Tidio, um, or any song, so like how does that sort of work? So what uh, we were doing in this is uh, sort of an activity that would lead them in that we can bring back the, the idea or the process when we're teaching recorder later. So let me show you some of the visuals of like when they step into class, um, what they will see. So I'm um, this is like my PowerPoint that I have up on the screen, just not in presentation mode. This is like in the working mode, so you can sort of see what it looks like here. And I'll try and describe it as best I can for uh, if you're listening on the podcast. So this is basically just like a welcome sort of a screen. Um, when kids come in, it says welcome to music. There's a little challenge rhythm at the bottom um, with 16th notes, quarter rests, half notes, just things that like I want them to be um, just as like a walk-in activity, a bell work activity. They come in, they read the rhythm. So when, um, so Kelly taught this, but we talked about the process of what you might do if you were, um, if you were going to teach this, um, let me see. And if you have any questions or anything along the way, please shout those out in the comments. I'll try and address them. So, um, what you, we might do is say like, okay, we learned this song last year. Here are the lyrics. Let's sing through Pass one window, tidy yo, pass two windows, tidy yo, pass, you know, that would be a great thing. We could also say, you know, why don't we, um, pat all the sounds. Pass one window, tidy yo. Pass two windows, tidy yo. Pass three windows, tidy yo. Jingle at the window, tidy yo. Jinglin', 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 Joe. Jingle at the window, tidy yo. So basically, just pat along as you sing. And a lot of people use this song when they're introducing the sixteenth note, when they're reinforcing sixteenth note, because the jingle at the window. That's a great example of sort of sixteenth note. So we might go through with just words, and then we could do a slide where we have the rhythmic notation above the word. Words, uh, is as best as possible because <laughs> it's it's sort of hard to get those uh, lyrics exactly underneath the notes but we did our best sort of uh, measure by measure anyway so this is just a visual of just the lyrics with rhythm rhythms on top um, and then we might say okay you know what I'm gonna do the same song but I'm gonna change something see if, or or uh, well, I'll go back to that in a second. So what we do next is mi so so la mi so so mi so so la mi re do mi so so la mi so 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 la mi re do 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 so so la la so 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 la mi re do. And usually that's sort of overwhelming for kids because it's the whole song all in solfege. Um, and you could even start out the class like singing it in solfege. Hey, do you know what song it is? It's Tidio. And then you could come back to it, you know, in this part and say like, oh yeah, let's do the solfege. So one thing that's helpful for kids is to have those same rhythms that they've already seen associated with the words. And then instead of the words underneath, just have the solfege sort of abbreviation. So M-S-S-L-M-S-S, M-S-S-L-M-R-R. -S 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 -R -R. And I even sometimes will sing it like that. Do you think that's what it's supposed to be? M-S-S-L-M-S-S. S S S S S L M R D. You think, but they're like, no, it's the solfege, right? Okay, so this is just giving them a chance to see that the the letter M it means me, and the letter S means so, and the letter L means la. Okay, great. So then this is a chance for them to practice that sort of what that would be to like if you're going to sing the solfege, you could do it like this instead of just writing it out or putting in a line or using hand signs. You could just put the abbreviation of the letter in underneath the rhythm and what would that look like? So sometimes we'll sing through this, usually um, one measure or one line at a time so they can sort of see and experience that. Um, another thing you could do then afterwards is like, let's look for commonalities. Let's look for things that are similar or maybe different, or, you know, there are parts that sound similar, sound different. So as I was showing Kelly, I was like, here are lots of ways that you can use visuals to help you out. So in this case, 
um, in the first three measures we just identified, you know, what's similar, what's different. Mi, so, so, la, mi, so, so. There's a, the purple line under the M, S, S at the end of that measure. Mi, so, so, la, mi, re, re. I put a blue line there. Mi, so, so, la, mi, so, so. The same purple as before because it's the exact same thing. And the reason I only highlighted and pulled those little pieces out is because mi, so, so, mi, re, re. It's like almost the same measure except the ending is a little different. And kids, sometimes kids will be like, it's like a suffix change. Sure, if you want to pull in ELA connections. So um, we might identify that and talk about, okay, well, that's a little bit different, whereas the other measures are the same. You could also, then I have another another uh, visual here where it's a dotted pink line under the so, 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 la, mi, re, do, in both the fourth and the sixth measures, because it's exactly the same, right? So like this basically is like, it's taking the exact same solfege visual of just the, the notes with the, the letter names underneath them, the solfege sort of abbreviations. But now it's helping to highlight and give them some sort of signposts along the way. Mi, so, so, la, mi, so, so, purple there. Mi, so, so, la, mi, re, re, blue there, because it's a little different. Mi, so, so, la, mi, so, so, purple there. So, 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 la, mi. And then that has the pink dotted. The one that really stands out to them is that fifth measure. Do, do, so, so, la, la, so, because it's very different, right? So I just put a yellow box around that. So that they can, they can now completely see, okay, there are some things that are similar, some things that are different. It sort of gives them some ideas. Just helps them sort of decode the song a little bit to, to understand even better. Now, the way that I did that was I had just the slide with just the solfege, and then I added one little element for them to look for. I added one more little element for them to look for. By the time they're done, it's like we've marked up the whole song, um, and this just gives them a, a way to sort of visualize. Look for commonalities. Look for differences. How does that... Um, how does that help you understand the song a little better? By this time, they've sung it several different times. They are way more confident on the solfege. Um, that's one way to do it. I also said there's another way, uh, when I was talking with Kelly, there's another way you could do that if you wanted. Um, instead of just highlighting little parts, you could do each measure. Um, and I'm going to skip the like um, one little piece at a time. And this is sort of an ending visual. It's the same basic idea of what I had before, but instead of just underlining something, um, I put a big colorful box behind each measure. So measure one and three, because they're exactly the same, are um, a dark blue. Measure two, because it's sort of like measure one, just like a variant, instead of a dark blue, it's a light blue. And then uh, measures four and six, so, 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 la, mi, re, because they're exactly the same, they're both red. And then the, the outlier, the weird one, measure five, is, is purple. This, again, it helps kids to see what's the same, what's different, why is it different. And it helps kids sort of break down. Instead of seeing this huge, long task, they see like, oh, it's this one little piece, this one little piece. And so then not only are they like able to perform it better because they see the commonalities, that also makes them start thinking in the future when we do a new song, what's similar, what's different, how does that, you know, to help them sort of um, decode in the future. They start looking for pieces that are same or looking for pieces that are different. Now I have two visuals here, one with very dark colors and one with sort of a lighter box behind it. I think either one, depending on what you want, um, either one is helpful. I like the darker one um, personally because I think it's easier for kids to sort of see um, but also because I know my projector and I know that if I do the really light one, it's it's very, very light. Um, so for me, this is a little bit more valuable. Um, another thing you can do with visuals is if you want it, instead of doing the solfege for Tidio, you could do the actual words and then you could change the color of some of those words. This messes some kids up because um, color in words uh, is, some kids have very <laughs> specific ideas about what words should be colored or how they're colored or it messes them up or sometimes having different colors is good or or not so good for kids with dyslexia there's also um, this thing called uh, synesthesia where um, kids or not kids just people in general um, see words as colored or each letter is its own colored so then that colors words too so this sort of messes people those folks up but that the population is sort of so small that that doesn't really um, in our setting, it's totally fine to color words. But this is like, instead of underlining in a color, it's just changing the color of the word. So you might lean towards underlining or whatever instead, because that might be a little easier. 
The other thing is if you're like projecting this onto a whiteboard, grab a whiteboard marker and just draw a line underneath. Like I've done it fancy in PowerPoint, but you don't have to do that. Um, you could just grab a marker and <laughs> do it old school. So this is sort of the prep work that we do before we ever get to instruments. And then when we do get to instruments, um, I like to put up a visual sort of like this. So this is a, a it, it looks like if you're looking straight down onto a metallophone, what does that look like? And so it's basically the whole bar board. I've taken some black, um, and this is not fancy. It, it, basically, I just took some clip art of um, the top of a xylophone, and I, I have linked on the links page if you want this exact set of clip art. Um, I can I, I link that there. But over top of F and B, because we take off the Fs and Bs, we take off T and Fa, or sorry, T, yeah, Fa and T. Um, I just took a black rectangle. I made it opaque, and I just put it over the bar. So it looks like it's like a grayed out sort of blacked out bar. It's not completely gone. It's You could still sort of see through, but um, I just took, um, like from the drawing tool, I took and made a rectangle that's the right size to fit over Fs and Bs. So that's there. I also took um, this set I made a couple years ago that I called Music Dots, and it's basically just solfege um, in little circles. I took those little circles and I put those over the bar. So over the bar C is, is Do or um, D is Ray over E is me so that kids when they're sort of understanding where does the solfege go on the instrument they can sort of see it up there in the bar and I don't use boom marker colors I'm sure there's someone out there asking because I don't use boom markers um, and I think the boom marker colors are weird why isn't there blue why <laughs> why does it have to be this weird like green color anyway I, don't get me started on that but uh, I just don't use boom markers so I don't use those colors because it doesn't act it doesn't like help my kids actively to see those colors in general. So I just don't use those colors. Anyway, um, so then when we were processing through the song, so then there's a visual of the xylophone with the solfege sort of overlaid on top. And then above it, I have just one line of the song. Mi, so, so, la, mi, so, so, mi, so, so, la, mi, re, re. So this gives kids a chance to sort of like, okay, here's what it would look like on your instrument. Here's the line itself. And so what I might say to kids is, okay, let's see, knowing that E is me, can you figure out this first line of the song? And they would go through and maybe play and try and figure that out. And then we could go, you know, to the next bar or to the next sort of set of two measures, the next phrase, we'd go through the, the third phrase um, and sort of help sort of decode that melody as we're playing. Another thing you could take, you know, I colored, use those colorful boxes. You could bring those colorful boxes back because they're used to seeing that. So having those colorful boxes behind the solfege um, and, and that top line might help them as they're decoding the song um, to put that with the xylophone visual. It might really help to have that there um, on the screen up there so they can see it. And then maybe, you know, once you think they've got it, you can transition to a full page with the solfege again. You can go back to the full page of solfege with those boxes, the colorful boxes to help sort of decode the song. You could go back to just the lyric slide. Um, you could do just the rhythms. I mean, there are a lot of things that you could do if you wanted to, to sort of help. But when, when my kids are decoding, having the solfege there is underneath the um, rhythms is really helpful. And I like to start with just sort of a blank go back to that page, the sort of a blank page with the solfege and then progress through and identify different pieces. So it helps them sort of understand what is it like to look for commonalities, look for similar things, look for differences so that when they are off site reading or something, they can do that themselves. Now, how does this relate to recorder? Well, um, let me flip the screen around. Um, when my students first start playing, we start with a lot of echoing. Um, we start with a, just B, A, and G. That's what I do. I know some people are G and E people, but or or A and C, or whatever you decide to start with, you should start with that. Um, but a lot of, um, a, there's a lot of echoing at first. There's a lot of like trying to play good tones. And then um, when we do add notation, I like to start with simple rhythms with just either the letter names written underneath or the solfege written underneath. Um, there are a couple ways I differentiate that. I can either write out solfege, do, mi, re, um, or I can write, um, when I write uh, notes, I do capital B, capital A, capital G. And then anytime you do solfege, you're supposed to do lowercase, so I like a lowercase d, a lowercase r, a lowercase m, and kids can sort of see the difference between the solfege and then the note names. 
Eventually it will add into on the staff or we'll do you know more sort of standard notation. But to start, um, we do stuff like this where uh, we make those connections with the solfege so that they're seeing this solfege. I mean, they're so used to solfege now that they're seeing that sort of continuum along. You can be on an uh, orphan instrument. It can be on a recorder. It can be sung. And then also in the moment, if I don't want the whole class playing recorders, I can have a third of them go over and play it on an orphan instrument, whatever song it is we're learning. Or I could have some of them sing. Or I could have some of them play recorder. And so th the nice thing then is that like, you can move, you can mix. It's not all just playing recorder. It's some playing recorder. It's some playing other things. So it's not like I'm going to do this one recorder unit for these six weeks, but more like I now have this melodic instrument that we can use at any time, pull it in and play different things. And then the nice thing is when you start with just the, you know, the, uh, like a pitch stack or the solfege underneath um, the rhythms, then you can go a little bit faster, you can do a little bit more, you can play more songs, you can explore a little bit faster. Um, and then when they're ready, you can start moving in and doing more notation. But then the nice thing is like, they're already comfortable with the instrument, they already play a good tone. Well, now we're gonna add this thing where we read more standard notation. So it's like less taxing on the brain because you're, you're introducing less all at once. If you, st if you start reading on the staff when you're playing for the first time, that is a lot for kids to process. Um, so I, I like to play the instrument first and then go to that more standard notation on treble clef. I also don't really introduce treble clef until we have a reason to use it. So until we're playing melodies, um, or singing and, and singing and reading, it doesn't, in my head, it doesn't make sense to be like, Hey, we're going to learn this random treble clef thing. We're not really applying it. But wow, isn't it cool? Like I, I want them to be able to either play or sing along or play on an orphan or something before I ever bring in the notation on a treble clef staff. So that's why I, I especially like doing it with recorder where we can, it's because it's so easy to like say, we got BAG, great, okay. And we are playing it and we're so good at it. And here's a song we really love. Okay, now look at this, this treble clef thing. Check this out. And they're, they're just three little dots moving around on three separate lines. So it's, it simplifies so much because it's just those three notes. We're just using songs we already know. And then they can sort of like, oh, I already, I already like sort of, I know this song. That's what it looks like on there. Oh, cool. And so like, it's not as big of a, a jump and a leap into trying to figure out how the notation works. But that's just me <laughs> in my class um, and, and how I do it. If, I mean, if you do recorder your way, do recorder your way. These are just some ideas of what you might want to do. But anyway, after Kelly taught him, this lesson a couple times, we tweaked a couple things, we moved things around a little bit, and the process of how you go through teaching the lesson maybe changes a little bit, but the visuals are really helpful. So whatever sort of visuals you do use, I would definitely encourage you to like play around, try a couple things. And the reason with Kelly, I was like, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do that. You know, I showed her like here, like eight different ways you could use the visuals to help you out. Um, and it was really fun because I was like, you know, since we have four sections of this grade, you could teach it four different ways. You know, like there was a day where um, I took a lesson and with the different sections, I taught it four different ways. And she was like, with this one, the solfege approach worked best or the whatever approach worked best. And it's sort of cool for her to see the same lesson taught different ways. And I was like, that's one of the cool things about being a teacher is it's like a, it's literally a learning lab. Like the kids are learning, but like you as a teacher can also try different things and see what works best. So showing you all these visuals tonight and talking with Kelly about all these visuals, I was like, here are some options. Try it out. See what really works for you. See what, see what you like. Okay. As American as Apple Pie is what this song is sort of based on, except not exactly the way they have it notated because I learned a different way. But that, that's a really great book to have in your collection. I use it all the time. Also on the links page, I linked in the clip art for the uh, xylophone visual. So if you're interested in that, that's there too. Okay, I hope this gave you some ideas and um, was a little bit helpful. If you have any questions, please leave those in the comments. I always try and come back to those and answer those whenever I can. Um, if not, I hope I'll see so many of y'all in Utah this Friday, Saturday at UMEA. Um, I'm excited to do three different sessions there. It's going to be lots of fun. Um, if not, I'll see everyone else next Monday night for another Musical Mondays video. Thanks everyone for joining me tonight.